Apostle Peter, formerly known as Simon, led a life of insignificance and invisibility in this Roman territory by the Sea of Galilee, in the lively fishing village of Bethsaida, which was the connecting point of Jewish and Gentile territory. However, all that changed when he encountered a man whose message he would eventually devote his life to spreading around 30 CE, and during this mission, a mere man would not believe what Peter encountered. Join us as we delve into the unbelievable stories of Apostle Peter that have never been told. The early life of Apostle Peter Simon, later known as Jesus Rock, was born to Jonah, a common peasant, and his wife about three years after Jesus was born to the Virgin Mary. This infant, like the majority of Jewish babies born during the period, was expected to live the life of a commoner, and survive under the harsh authority of the Roman Empire. Simon was born into a strong political and theological conflict around 1 BC, greatly affecting his character and life. Born into a society where fishing and trading were the main sources of income, Simon had to develop a strong sense of self-assurance at a young age to survive in his environment. He was not calm. On the contrary, he was extremely temperamental. Zebedee, who was related to the woman who would eventually become Simon's bride, and his father, Jonah, began an informal fishing business when Simon was still a young boy. John, a well-known follower of Jesus and a close companion of Simon, was also born into Zebedee's family. These connections demonstrate how connected their community is. The fishing industry in Bethsaida was a significant sector subject to strict Roman regulation and taxation. It was not a small-scale enterprise. To satisfy the needs of the Roman fishing business, fishermen like Simon were looked down upon and labeled as unpleasant. At 25, Simon married a woman from his community and moved to the bustling port town of Capernaum with his wife and kids. On the banks of the Jordan River, Simon, his brother Andrew, and their in-laws first heard of John the Baptist's revolutionary teachings around 27 CE. While many found the Baptist fascinating, Simon's duty as a fisherman left him with little luxury of being open to a message primarily focused on the afterlife. His reality was present, and he knew how to endure the brutal realities of Roman oppression. But Andrew, his brother, experienced a major change of view after receiving John's message. Andrew joined the movement, leaving Simon and others to run the fishing business. Simon had no idea at the time how much his indifferent views on religion and God would change. The appearance of Jesus of Nazareth marked a major change in Simon's life. The turning point and first encounter. One day, while Andrew was accompanying John, he saw Jesus arrive, declared to be the Lamb of God, and baptized by John. Andrew was shocked. Maybe he thought of Genesis 22, where the binding of Isaac predicts the teachings of Jesus Christ. In that account, Isaac asked his father Abraham where the lamb for the burnt offering was. In response, Abraham told his son that God would provide the lamb for the burnt offering. Andrew was understandably taken aback when John, a prominent prophet and baptizer, revealed this modest man as God's lamb in front of the world. Now just very quick, if it's your first time here on my channel, I would appreciate if you would like the video so that you can help me to continue spreading Christian messages. Subscribe and also click that notification bell so you won't miss any of the next videos that are uploaded every day. All right? Let's keep rolling. Andrew accompanied Jesus for a while and listened to his lectures. What he heard convinced him that John the Baptist was on to something. Not long after, 
Andrew persuaded his brother Simon to see Jesus. Simon, who was at first suspicious, took little time to observe Jesus' heavenly authority. When Jesus first saw Simon, he was disappointed and hopeless because he would return home empty-handed after spending several hours in the deep sea. He had an empty fishing boat. Following his speech, Jesus commanded Simon to cast his nets into deep water in hopes of catching fish, as recorded in the book of Luke. Simon replied, Master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but I'll let down the nets because you said so. After doing so, they caught so many fish that their nets started to break. They then called for assistance from their partners in the second boat, who arrived and loaded both boats to the point that they started to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he went to his knees and pleaded to Jesus, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Simon and his friends were amazed at the number of fish they had caught. During that initial encounter, not only did Simon acknowledge Jesus' authority, but Jesus also acknowledged Simon's strength. Simon was encouraged to accompany Jesus and assured that he would become a fisher of men. By then, Simon had lost his hesitancy and followed Jesus by laying down his fishing net. Not long later, Jesus made a significant announcement regarding his vision for Simon. Why did Jesus rename Simon? Jesus questioned his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? As he arrived at the Caesarea Philippi region, John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets were the names that some mentioned in response. But what about you? Who do you say I am? He asked Simon. In response, Simon Peter said, You are the Son of the Living God, the Messiah. Simon, son of Jonah, you are blessed because you have received revelations from your Heavenly Father, not from flesh and blood. You are Peter, and I will build my church on this rock, so that even Hades' gates cannot overrun it. I will also give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Earth will be bound in heaven by whatever you bind it to, and released in heaven by whatever you free. This incident marked the beginning of Simon, now known as Peter, the rock of Jesus' rise into recognition and leadership. But the road ahead would be complex. It will need the greatest amount of endurance and be very difficult. Peter had an important transformation when he decided to join Jesus and gave up his family, security, and fishing livelihood. He was joining forces with a fresh revolution against the strict traditional council of the Sanhedrin and the oppressive Roman government. Peter's faith in Jesus as the Messiah was strengthened by the many miracles he saw and took part in, including the healing of his mother-in-law and the turning of water into wine at the wedding in Canaan. Peter's journey was not without difficulties and uncertainties, though. First, while they all sailed on the Sea of Galilee, he experienced a deep crisis of faith for a brief time. It took place right after Jesus had fed the 5,000. While Jesus stayed to pray, he sent Peter and the other disciples into the boat. However, when the disciples found themselves in a storm on the Sea of Galilee that evening, their boat was hammered by the wind and waves. They were slightly dumbfounded when they saw a figure approaching them on the sea. They thought it was a ghost because they were afraid. But Jesus saw their fear and immediately reassured them that nothing happened and there was no reason to worry. At the very instant, Peter questioned Jesus, saying, Lord, tell me to come to you on water if it is you. After this, Jesus extended an invitation to him. After that, Peter gets out of the boat and crosses the water to go to Jesus. But as Peter realizes the strong wind in the middle of the walk, he gets scared and rapidly sinks into the ocean. He calls out, Lord, save me, to Jesus. Without any delay, Jesus extends his hand and grasps Peter. This is when Jesus made the well-known remark, You of little faith, why did you doubt? He asked Peter. The wind stopped as they got inside the boat following this incident. 
This event taught Peter a valuable lesson about trust and faith. The Ultimate Experience of Transfiguration Peter's experience of the transfiguration during his time with Jesus also proved to be crucial. It occurred one day when Jesus led Peter, James, and John to a high mountain that historians have frequently identified as Mount Tabor. Jesus is transformed in front of them as they are on the mountain. His garments became as bright as light, and his face glowed like the sun. Elijah and Moses suddenly showed up and started conversing with Jesus. This law, represented by Moses and the prophet Elijah, certifies Jesus' status as the Messiah. Eagerly, Peter offers to construct three tabernacles or shelters, one for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. As Peter is still speaking, a brilliant cloud surrounds them, and a voice from the cloud says, Listen to him. This is my son, whom I love. The disciples collapse to the ground, frightened. But when they look above, they see no one but Jesus. He then tells them to keep silent and reveal what they have seen only after his resurrection. The instructions given are for different reasons. First, the reason may be that Jesus was not ready to break the news to his disciples because he had yet to finish his preparation plan for what would happen after the revelation was confirmed to them. Through his great experiences, though, Peter needed to be more fully aware of Jesus' role and mission. The Death of Jesus Christ and Post-Resurrection As his earthly mission draws to a conclusion, Jesus starts explaining to his followers why he must journey to Jerusalem, suffer greatly at the hands of the top priests, elders, and teachers of the law, and then be killed and risen from the dead on the third day. Startled by this realization, Peter pulls Jesus aside and tells him, Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Then Jesus turns to face Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block for me. You are thinking only of human concerns, not the concerns of God. It's crucial to remember that Jesus addressed the Spirit, encouraging Peter to utter those statements. Jesus is aware that Peter is not a devil. While Peter's statement was motivated by love and concern for Jesus, it was also a product of a misinterpretation of the purpose of Jesus' mission and the nature of his kingdom. Jesus' final supper with his twelve disciples was the summit of Peter's discipleship. Jesus declares that one of them is going to turn against him. As a result, the disciples began to feel uneasy and doubtful and Peter was moved to declare his undying devotion to Jesus. Even if it meant dying, he vowed to Jesus that he would never betray or deny him. In response, Jesus tells Peter that he will deny knowing him three times before the rooster crows the following morning. Soon after, Jesus was arrested. As Jesus left the Last Supper to pray, he walked to the Garden of Gethsemane, where the incident occurred. Among the disciples, Judas Iscariot, the betrayer, presents himself with a cohort of soldiers and some of the Pharisees and chief priests' members to arrest Jesus. Once again, his impatience makes him crave the soldiers arresting Jesus. Therefore, Peter instantly draws the sword and cuts off the right ear of the high priest's servant, Malchus. Jesus rebukes Peter and tells him to sheathe his sword. Afterward, he said to him, Everyone who wields a sword will be killed by it. Jesus heals the servant's ear upon this, manifesting his cast-iron commitment to non-violence and compassion in the face of betrayal and capture. That same evening, when Jesus was brought to where the chief priests lived to stand trial, Peter and the other disciples followed him at a distance. A servant girl approaches Peter in the high priest's courtyard and acknowledges him as a follower of Jesus. But Peter denies it, claiming, I don't know him. This occurred twice more, and Peter responded similarly. Just after the third denial, a rooster crows, realizing what Jesus had foretold at the Last Supper. Peter is deeply shocked 
by this knowledge as he recalls Jesus' words. Filled with grief and remorse, Peter departs the scene in tears. When Jesus was hung on the cross, nobody knew where Peter was. There is no word about Peter in the Gospels until after Jesus had risen from the dead, after he denied Jesus following the event. He could have been hiding, just like a majority of the other disciples, so that they could evade arrest or imprisonment because of the association that they may have had with Jesus. Nonetheless, their reaction may seem cowardly, but they were in a state where someone they considered their leader was arrested, crucified, and dying, all of which were under a blanket of fear, confusion, and despair. When Mary Magdalene and the other women came back to the tomb on the third day after Jesus had been put to death and buried, they found the stone rolled away from the cave, which is usually used to cover the entrance to the grave, and Jesus was no longer there. Later, Jesus makes multiple appearances for the disciples, including Peter. One particularly important meeting happened near the Sea of Galilee. After spending the night fishing, Peter and several other disciples returned empty-handed. When Jesus first appeared on the seashore at dawn, his disciples did not know who he was. Jesus then addressed them. They caught a lot of fish when he instructed them to cast their net on the right side of the boat. The minute John recognized Jesus, the disciples were in complete shock. He then told Peter, it is the Lord, and Peter, in his typical rash manner, wrapped his outer garment around him and jumped into the water to swim to shore while the others followed in the boat. Once on shore, they found Jesus with a fire of burning coals, fish, and bread. Following his invitation for them to bring some of the fish they had caught, Jesus offered them fish and bread to eat. This was one of the post-resurrection appearances where Jesus shared a meal with his followers. After they finished eating, Jesus had a serious discussion with Peter. He asked Peter three times, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Each time Peter expressed his love, Jesus responded with the command, feed my lambs, care for my sheep, and feed my sheep. This discussion highlights the forgiveness and renewal of Peter the disciple, which in turn prepares him for church leadership in the early Christian church. Forty days after the rising of Jesus Christ, he showed himself to several of his disciples, particularly Peter. He did that during one of his visits and gave them all his last instructions at once. He told them to wait in Jerusalem until they received the Holy Spirit. He also charged them with a duty to act as his witnesses in Jerusalem, all of Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the world. After giving the instructions, the disciples, including Peter, watched as Jesus went into heaven. While they were gazing upward, two angels clad in white arrived beside them and asked the men of Galilee why they stood there gazing up at the sky. This same Jesus, who has been taken from you to heaven, will return like you saw him go. After that, as directed by Jesus, Peter left the Mount of Olives and returned to Jerusalem. Following Jesus ascending to heaven, Peter and the other disciples returned to Jerusalem and assembled in an upper room where they prayed and prepared for the arrival of the Holy Spirit, which would usher in his leadership of the early Christian church. They were united in prayer as they awaited the Holy Spirit. Not long after, a sound resembling the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the entire house. Then tongues of fire rested on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, allowing them to speak in different languages. Peter then rose in front of the gathered crowd and gave a powerful sermon in which he explained that what they were seeing was the fulfillment of God's prophecy and promise. He discussed Jesus' life, death, and resurrection declaring him to be both Lord and Christ. On that day, around 3,000 people accepted his message and were baptized, which signified the beginning of the early Christian church. The whole story of Apostle Peter. Following Jesus ascending to heaven, Peter assumed the role of the early church's leader and caretaker following Jesus' ascension. Even though Peter had numerous stumbles after taking on leadership roles, he remained a model and unwavering in his devotion to sharing the good news of salvation, which was Jesus' assignment. 
One of Peter's first acts of leadership was to fill the post of Judas Iscariot, who committed suicide after publicly betraying Jesus Christ. Matthias was chosen as the twelfth apostle by Peter in the lead role. Early in his ministry, Peter performed a miracle at the temple called Beautiful, which caught the attention of the Jewish leadership. Peter and John were on their way to the temple for prayer when they came across a man who had been lame since birth and was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he would beg every day. The man asked Peter and John for money when he saw the apostles. In response to him, Peter merely replied, I cannot give you silver or gold, but I will give you all I have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Get up and walk. Then Peter helped the man by taking him by hand. His ankles and feet strengthened immediately so he could rise and walk. He joined them in the temple courts, walking, leaping, and thanking God. The commoners witnessing the miracle were astounded by it, and Peter started preaching about Jesus, the Son of God, who had risen from the dead on Solomon's porch. The captain of the temple guard, the Sadducees, and the priests were all greatly unsettled when they heard the teachings of Peter and John. Peter and John were caught and locked up till the next day because it was evening. The high priest brought Peter and John the following day to question them about what they had done. To be more precise, they were curious as to what name or power had allowed them to heal the disabled person. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter spoke confidently to the Sanhedrin, declaring that the healing was done in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom they had crucified, but whom God had risen from the dead. Peter claimed that Jesus was the only source of salvation. This was the last thing the council wanted to hear, but the Sanhedrin seeing the healed man as evidence of God's might in operation, could not say or do much in opposition. On the one hand, they were determined to stop the apostles' teaching from being heard, but at the same time, they could not go against the power of the miracle. In the end, they ordered these two to say nothing and teach nothing in Jesus' name. But Peter and John, on the other hand, insisted that God commanded them to obey him rather than man, and that they could not keep themselves from telling what they had experienced and learned. The Sanhedrin threatened them once more, but eventually decided not to punish them because of the many people who had seen the miracle. Therefore, they were freed. Among the twelve disciples, Peter was the one who led the church in running its governance, instruction, and decision-making. One such instance involved addressing Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira, a married couple, sold some property in the early Christian community. Instead of contributing the full sale price to the community, as was customary among the believers, they conspired to keep a portion of the money while claiming to donate the entire amount. Ananias delivered a share of the money to the apostles. However, Inspired by heavenly understanding, Peter challenged Ananias about why he had lied to the Holy Spirit and pocketed some money. Peter clarified that although the property belonged to them, they were not obligated to sell it or give the money raised to charity. The deception was not directed at humanity, but at God. Ananias collapsed and died immediately after hearing Peter's comments. Unaware of her husband's fate, Sapphira entered about three hours later. Peter questioned her about the amount of money, offering her the opportunity to be truthful. However, she continued to tell the same lies. Peter then told her that she had tested the Lord's spirit, that the men who had buried her husband were at the door, and that she too would be carried out. She immediately collapsed and died at his feet. She was buried with her husband. All who heard about these events, including the church, were frightened. Soon afterward, the Jewish authorities became more interested in Peter and the apostles. The high priest ordered Peter and the other apostles to be arrested because he was concerned about the apostles' increasing power. They were imprisoned and scheduled to stand trial. But during the night, a Lord's angel unlocked the jail's doors and instructed them to proceed to the temple courts to continue their teaching. 
The apostles followed instructions. When the high priest and his associates gathered the Sanhedrin and summoned the apostles from jail, they discovered they had disappeared. They were later discovered lecturing within the temple. They were brought back, and the high priest questioned them, reminding them of the previous orders not to teach in Jesus' name. Peter and the apostles agreed that we must obey God above humans. The Sanhedrin was enraged and wanted to execute them straight away, but Gamaliel, a respected Pharisee and law teacher, advised them to be cautious. Gamaliel advised them to release the apostles, claiming that if their work was from God, it could not be stopped. The Sanhedrin followed Gamaliel's suggestion before the apostles were fogged. Following the fogging, they commanded them not to speak in the name of Jesus before releasing them. Peter and the apostles left the Sanhedrin happy, believing themselves worthy of suffering in Jesus' name. They proceeded to preach and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Shortly after, Peter had an unusual encounter with Simon, a sorcerer. Simon the careless sorcerer. Simon was a Samaritan sorcerer who impressed people with his magical abilities. After hearing Philip preach the gospel in Samaria, he converted to Christianity and was baptized. Simon followed Philip and observed the signs and wonders he did. When Peter and John landed in Samaria, they prayed for new Christians to receive the Holy Spirit. Immediately after, the Holy Spirit was given to the believers. Upon witnessing this, Simon made a financial offer to the apostles, requesting to purchase this ability to lay hands on others and receive the Holy Spirit. Taken aback, Peter harshly scolded Simon, telling him that his heart was not straight before God and that he could not buy God's gift with money. Peter's early work is significant, but needs to be better recorded. Although details are scarce, Peter continued to travel, preach, and spread the Christian faith. Some early accounts suggest he may have ministered in various locations, including Asia Minor. Peter also wrote letters or epistles to record some of his teachings. In his first epistle, 1 Peter, Peter addressed the exiles scattered over the regions of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. The book of 1 Peter emphasizes the themes of hope, the enduring word of God, and leading a virtuous life despite hardship to encourage and counsel Christians facing adversity. In his second epistle to the church, Peter warns against false teachers and urges followers to deepen their faith and understanding of Jesus. He highlighted the certainty of Christ's return and the value of living a good life. Peter, like many of the apostles, was martyred for his faith. According to early Christian belief, Peter was killed in Rome under Emperor Nero's reign around AD 6468. He's claimed to have been crucified upside down at his request, feeling unworthy of dying in the same way as Jesus. Most believe the Apostle Peter rests on Vatican Hill, now St. Peter's Basilica. Archaeological and historical investigations, including those from the 20th century, have strengthened this idea. In the late 1940s, research under the Church of St. Peter's Basilica revealed a cemetery from ancient Rome. In this particular area, a burial chamber was discovered, which was presumed to belong to Apostle Peter by many academics. The tomb contained bones submitted to examination and found to be those of a robust guy in his 60s. This, in turn, confirmed that Peter was indeed the person in question. All Christian leaders, irrespective of their denominations, agree that God used Peter to build and shape the Church of God. The story of Peter, from a simple fisherman to the apostle who founded the church, displays how transformation, faith, leadership, and salvation occur. The letters of Peter have been vital to Christian teaching and ethics, and his leadership and martyrdom have led to admiration from his followers to this day. Thanks for reading. Let us know your thoughts on the stories of Apostle Peter 
that have never been told in the comment section below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more videos like this. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share with your friends so we can keep making them. For more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and remember to click on the notification bell. Also, be sure to check out our other videos as well. Thanks for watching.